is the summer of 1984. A party of American congressmen are flying into Freudenstadt in West Germany. Herr Jung, the regional forester, greets his chief from Bonn. The visitors and the press are here to see an environmental catastrophe in the making. Freudenstadt lies in the Black Forest, and the Black Forest is dying. The trees have been killed, it's believed, by the form of air pollution called acid rain. That's why Congressman Henry Waxman, an air pollution specialist, is here. Well, it's even worse than I expected to find here. Uh, we're seeing probably what we're going to find in the United States in a few short years, in the northeastern part of the nation particularly, but maybe in other places as well. We are beginning to find it in the United States, from Mount Mitchell here in North Carolina to Camel's Hump in the Green Mountains of Vermont. We've seen lakes acidify and die because of acid rain. Now we shall in all probability have to add destruction of forests as another penalty of widespread air pollution. For many years, the smokestacks of Europe and North America, spewing sulfur from coal burning, have been political battlegrounds. Protest banners mark out these sulfur emitters. Sulfur reduction proposals abound in the Congress, state legislatures, and European parliaments. But this film will show that just cutting sulfur may not stop acid rain. Lakes and forests may still be at risk. The protests are daring and spectacular. But the latest research shows they may be aimed at too simple a target. The science of acid rain is changing. As a result, the politics will change, particularly since what's now at stake in Europe and America is the future of our forests. The Black Forest, perhaps the most famous forest in the world. Meticulously cared for, every square meter is familiar to the rangers. Here, just a few years ago, a most alarming sight began to appear. The needles on the Norway spruce turn yellow. Then they drop, and then the tree dies. Herr Jon charted the progress of this forest sickness. By 1982, out of his 50 square mile area, just a few stands were still marked green or healthy. The rest were yellow, orange, and red. Sick, very sick, and dying. Or black, dead. And in the year 1983, that is the next card, wurde der Wald genau wieder durch die Rangers untersucht und kartiert. Und Sie sehen, nach einem Jahr keine grüne Fläche mehr. Die Überzahl ist schwerkrank und absterbend und tot. Das sind die schwarzen Flächen. Das ist der Fortschritt in einem Jahr, das in einem Jahr so erschreckend. The Germans are deeply attached to their forests. They use them a great deal. And now they are seeing them die. Blue means dying. Red is dead. The foresters have marked the trees for the hikers. The signs leave no room for doubt. A number of air pollutants from cars and industry are involved, they claim. Einfach 
Ich denke mal wieder an Kinder und Kindeskinder, mhm. gell? Ich habe womöglich überhaupt keine Bäume hier nachher. Hoffen wir es nicht, dass es so wird. Wenn die Kinder mal aufwachsen und keinen kein Wald mehr sehen, die kennen die Wälder nur noch von Postkarte und, und Kalender. Ne? Das ist schon deprimierend. Help us. Hilf uns, cry the trees. German prosperity, like our own, is not without cost. Sweden, an acid lake. The world contains many national boundaries, but the atmosphere ignores them. Twenty years ago, a Swedish scientist discovered the significance of that, before nature showed any damage. Svante Odin. You know, at that time, Almost nothing could be seen in nature. You could not see anything in the lakes, nothing in the forest here. Only these more or less artificial maps told that something was going on. So then the show started on acid rain. Mapping the chemistry of Europe's rainfall, Svante Odin picked up a clear change. In the decade from the mid-50s, acidity was going up dramatically clearly spreading out from sources in the industrial center. Then he made a vital connection with events which were just beginning to be noticed. A fishery inspector called me up and, and just questioned, is it possible that the fish kill we have here in Western Sweden could be attributed to atmospheric conditions? So that was a shock to me equivalent to that of the catastrophe of Titanic. The idea that rainfall could be acidified by industrial pollutants was at first ridiculed. But it's been confirmed over and over by atmospheric scientists. In Virginia, Jim Galloway operates part of a national rain chemistry network. The simple collector would be triggered by rainfall. And here in the eastern United States, it always contains acids. We know without a shadow of a doubt that these acids are indeed from our industrial activities. In all cases, when you're far away from industrial activities, the acidity of the rain and the, comp the concentrations of sulfuric and nitric acids are about 10 times less than the, what they are in the eastern United States. The origin of the acids was at one time a mystery, because no polluter actually emits them. But it turned out they are formed in the atmosphere itself. Burning anything, oil or coal, produces nitrogen oxides. Cars emit traces of unburnt fuel, hydrocarbons, as well as nitrogen oxides. And coal-fired power plants give off sulfur oxides as well as nitrogen oxides. Up in the sunlight and moisture of the atmosphere, this chemical cocktail goes through more than 150 reactions over the course of a day or two. The result? Three main pollutants. Ozone, a corrosive gas, and two important acids, nitric and sulfuric. By the time these reactions are complete, the pollutants may have traveled hundreds of miles. Western Sweden, one of the areas that's been hardest hit by acid rain. This lake has been acidified for more than a decade. The fish have long since gone. Now, a thick Felt like blanket, it's called filamentous algae, covers everything.
Nature has at least found something to replace the rich community of plants and animals that should exist here. Another typical symptom, sphagnum moss, normally confined to the shore, has invaded the lake. Biologists like Hans Hulteberg now see these signs of collapsed ecosystems on a massive scale in Sweden. We have at least three or four thousand severe acid lakes like this one. But we have another about 14, 15,000 lakes that are damaged. So a total of about 18, 20,000 lakes out of our 90,000 lakes are affected by acidity. From Sweden to the Adirondack Mountains in upstate New York, An area of great natural beauty, it attracts sportsmen and vacationers by the thousand. And like Sweden, it's on the receiving end of our air pollution as well. Bill Marlowe was a forest ranger for 35 years. He built a cabin up here at Woods Lake, and he's watched the lake die. He's given up fishing, and he's seen the algae come in, as they have in Sweden. The last trout was caught in here in 1969. There's been, and the shiners went out about three, four years ahead of the trout. There was a lot of vegetation. All this lower end of the lake here was solid lily pads. You hear no birds, you, you, where these lakes always supported a big population of swallows. There was one pair here this summer. Out here in the lily pads, there used to be hundreds and hundreds of bullheads or bullfrogs. Uh, I used to have a Boy Scout troop, and I'd bring them up here, and they still talk about going to Woods Lake and listening to the bullfrog chorus up there in June. And it was there were nights you couldn't sleep because it was so loud, and the boys would come out here on the dock and they'd yell, "Shut up!" at the bullfrogs. Uh, now there was two here last summer, one on each side of the lake. Enough young brook trout to bring tears to the eyes of Bill Marlowe. But they will never make it to the end of a fisherman's line. Instead, they're being brought into this acid lake. It's an experiment run by Carl Schofield of Cornell University on the right, one of the world's experts on the effects of acid on fish. Eventually, their work may lead to the rehabilitation of New York's acid lakes. But for now, the fish are like the miner's canary in the cage. They are used to test the condition of the water. And it's not just acid that the fish have to withstand. There is also aluminum, dissolved from the surrounding soil by acid rain. Lake chemistry is always closely linked to the land. 24 hours have passed. It was Carl Schofield who discovered the special vulnerability of fish to a combination of aluminum and acid. The gills on the right are normal. The others show erosion and clogging typical of aluminum and acid attack. Fish without the delicate gill membrane simply suffocate. Why does a lake acidify? First, of course, it must be in an area of highly acid rain. This is the part of the continent that receives rain about 10 times more acidic than normal. Within the area, soil plays a crucial role because rain must filter through it before reaching the streams and lakes. All soils have some ability to absorb acid. How much depends on the soil thickness. But some soils contain as well a key agent that neutralizes acids and protects the water. 
Jim Galloway. The active agent in the soil that causes that protective mechanism to occur is calcium carbonate, the limestone soils. These beakers of soil were gathered in this area. These soils are acid soils, no naturally occurring calcium carbonate in them. We're going to make a soil with calcium carbonate using a commercially available form of calcium carbonate. And now we need an acid. This lemon contains citric acid, which is not found in rain, but it's about as acidic as rainfall. Now this is the acid soil that has no calcium carbonate on it. When you add an acid to it, as so, you can see there's no response. If this had been acid rain falling on the soil, the acid rain would flow right through into the lake and stream, causing acidification. The other half of the lemon we're putting into the soil with calcium carbonate. As you see, there's a chemical reaction occurring, bubbles are being produced, the acid rain is interacting with the calcium carbonate. This process dissolves the calcium carbonate and neutralizes the acidity of the lemon juice. And therefore, the stream and lake draining from that soil would never have been acidified. In the most intensive project of its kind, teams from New York State are now visiting many of the 2,500 lakes in the Adirondacks. And there's a lot they have to take along. Here, there is no protective limestone, and these high mountain areas have thin soils, so there's very little capacity to absorb acid. It makes these remote mountain lakes doubly vulnerable. Nets have been set out to check the health of fish populations. Look out. Water samples will be analyzed later in the laboratory. Mm. And why the llama? It's the only pack animal that you don't have to bring food along for. In the Adirondacks, there are 200 lakes too acid for fish. About the same number shows some damage. Canada has about 2,000 fishless lakes, but for the rest of the acid rain area, we don't know how much damage might have occurred. 210 grams. Western Sweden. Like the Adirondacks, here the soils are thin and without limestone. So man has had to intervene. Limestone, calcium carbonate, is added directly to the water to neutralize the acids. Liming in Sweden is now going ahead on a massive scale. It takes about two and a half tons per acre every year or two, costing maybe $50,000 a year for one average lake. An expert on the effects of liming is Hans Hulteberg. The lake he's studying here with Svante Odin is making good progress. You can see that the plants living in the lake is uh, fairly clean. We limed the lake in 1982, and uh, since then all the mosses have died off and uh, the filament is algae have disappeared. And it's all clean on the bottoms. You can see the rocks, you can see the plants, the original plants in the lakes. It's, it's more like a natural lake now. This lime stream has now been restocked with fish, as Hans Hulteberg will do next year with his lake. Surveys show they're starting to reproduce. Success, but at quite a price. And the liming must be continued for as long as there's acid in the rain.
Nevertheless, with Sweden's success, an experimental program is just getting underway in the Adirondacks. It may be a stopgap measure, but it is the only way in the short term to bring these lakes back to life. the city of Cologne, West Germany. In the shadow of the famous cathedral, you could be back in the Middle Ages. The stonemasons practice their ancient skills. But the carving he's measuring has been restored with white plaster. Then the restored pieces are copied in new stone. Cologne Cathedral is one of the greatest medieval buildings in Europe, but much of its fabric, like these carvings, is brand new. It is becoming a 20th century building. Gradually, stone by stone, 60 builders are removing the ravages of air pollution. Acid rain is dissolving the sandstone away. Sites like these are common throughout Europe, and not so unusual in America, too. They're another part of the price we pay for our industry, our electricity, our cars. Recently, the Germans have begun to think seriously about the costs of air pollution. Emission controls on cars are likely. Even speed limits on the Autobahn have been suggested. It's because of the new element in the acid rain story, forests. Professor Zech works on the eastern border of Germany, on the opposite side of the country from the Black Forest. Now we are arriving at an elevation of 1,000 meter. Here is a 1,000 meter stone. On the left side, you have a lot of dead trees. And we'll have a look on them. Now we are at the top of the Schneeberg, and this is the worst picture uh, we have here in Middle Europe, as far as I know. Like the Black Forest and the Adirondacks, this is a vacation area. Here, the small villages depend on the forests not just for the timber industry, but to attract tourists as well. Again, like the Black Forest, the decline came with ferocious speed. In the last few years, yellowing symptoms, called chlorosis, have become widespread. The result is inevitable. If we have now chlorosis, uh, the result is that the sugar production, the photosynthesis, last not least, is disturbed. After the yellowing, this needle, after some time, will be dropped. Yeah? You have a naked branchlet. Yeah? And uh, if you have a lot of needle dropping to the soil, the uh, biomass of the tree uh, capable for photosynthesis is sharply reduced. The tree has to die. What's happening in Germany's forests? Could this be a natural phenomenon? Unlikely. Forests throughout the country are damaged. But natural conditions like soil and climate vary widely. There is a crucial hint in scenes like this. 
The trees are at the top of the mountain. In fact, wherever forest damage is found in Germany, the higher the elevation, the worse the damage. Why should altitude be important? Flying above the Adirondacks, atmospheric scientist Volker Mohn. These clouds we are looking at are quite pretty. It was as a surprise that these clouds that we see out there are so heavily polluted with sulfate, nitrate, oxidants, etc. It's not just the clouds here in the Adirondacks, it's the clouds everywhere in the world, everywhere where the, where in proximities to uh, industrial emissions. We might even say that clouds are the uh, vacuum cleaners of the atmosphere. Down on Whiteface Mountain, they catch the vacuum cleaners. There's a front moving in. They'll be able to catch a cloud event, as they call it. Soon the summit at 5,000 feet will be in the clouds, and so will their observatory. Inside this cloud, the winds are up to 50 miles an hour, but that's ideal conditions for the cloud catcher. Whipping through the strands of the catcher, the cloud moisture builds up into droplets, then drains down into the observatory cabin below. Drop by drop, it's analyzed, and it's carrying a huge load of acidity. Volker Monen pioneered cloud research here. And he's made some striking discoveries about what they contain. The clouds we observe at Whiteface Mountain uh, show a level of pollution that is typically 10 times higher in concentration than we find in precipitation at the same spot. Uh, that tells us that clouds are great concentrators of pollutant material. If the clouds simply evaporate, their pollutant load is dispersed throughout the atmosphere. But there's another possibility. If the mountain intercepts prior to evaporation, then it's the leaves and the needles, the stems, and eventually the soil that receives this high concentration of uh, pollutant material with the water, with the cloud water. The mountain tops, where forest damage is worst, spend up to 200 days a year bathed in this polluted cloud water. Just like the white-faced cloud catcher, conifer needles efficiently comb out the acid moisture. What effect could it have? Here in Essen, Dr. Prince believes he's found one possibility. He raises trees in mountain conditions using the three main pollutants ozone, a trace of which is added to the air in the chambers, and nitric and sulfuric acids, contained in simulated cloud water on the needles. As it drops off, this acid fog, as they call it, is found to have washed vital nutrients out of the needles, needles weakened by the corrosive effects of ozone. It works in such a way that the the protection layer of the cells, or the scientists say the cell membrane system, is weakened. It, this system loses its protective function. If now the acid fog comes to the needles, to the cells, very important nutrients are washed out, are leached out. Above all, magnesium, but some other, other important 
uh, nutrients too, for example, potassium and calcium. There's no yellowing of the needles, but the loss of nutrients is still highly significant because the pattern of yellow needle tips seen by Professor Zech is a known symptom of a particular nutrient deficiency disease, magnesium deficiency. If you look up in this direction, you see that whole parts of the forests are completely dead now. Yeah, these are not old trees, these are young trees. They are about, let me say, uh, 30 or 40 years old. And they have died because of this magnesium deficiency. Ozone, acid clouds, loss of nutrients. It's a possible mechanism. One of many new ideas that scientists on both sides of the Atlantic are suggesting could be the cause of forest decline. Another dying German forest? No. This is Camel's Hump in Vermont, where it was discovered that America too has a problem with its forests. The bearer of the tidings was a forestry professor, Tom Sikama, who has a house at the base of the mountain, like a doctor at the bedside of a sick patient. Twenty years ago, Tom Sikama picked Camel's Hump as a site to study typical mountain forest ecology. As a graduate student, he walked the trails, making standard measurements, like the area of forest floor covered by various species, in 1979, he did it again. This is actually the 1964 uh, field book. And uh, what we found then in comparing the 1964 with the more recent 79 uh, survey was that for spruce, uh, that area was reduced by about 50%. So about half of the spruce uh, in those larger trees had, had died in that 15, 17 year time frame. Red spruce should live for 300 years. Something had gone wrong. When we were doing this particular area in the 60s, this was what we would speak of as sort of a closed canopy forest. That is right where we're standing now, looking up. Uh, you're, the uh, forest would essentially have trees at maybe 100 feet or 70 feet, uh, making a, a canopy. And uh, now, looking around, uh, it's a pretty scraggly uh, stand. Most of those trees, the large ones, uh, have died. Uh, and they just die standing, needles come off, and eventually they probably break off, leaving uh, stubs. The discovery set off a flurry of activity. Students and professors flocked to the forests. Trees up and down the east coast were cored and measured. Nice one. That's pretty good. Tom Sikama was joined by a colleague, Art Johnson. Okay, 13.5. Together, they made a startling discovery. This is a section from about a 300-year-old red spruce from Camel's Hump. And we can see that when it started out growing and was a rather small tree, perhaps 10 or 12 feet high, it was growing suppressed within the canopy where it's rather dark and the growth rings are quite narrow. We see that there is a couple of periods of release or a couple of periods of better growth when perhaps a neighbor fell over and the tree had a little bit more light or some more resources to work with. And then we find that there's a very interesting event that occurred about 10 to 15 years ago, which begins right here. There is a rather abrupt change to extremely narrow increments. This event is really quite synchronized from trees that we found growing in Maine to North Carolina. Sometime after 1960, we found that there was this synchronized change to very slow growth rates in red spruce. Red spruce is a major species of mountain forests. Wherever Art Johnson and his colleagues have looked, spruce trees are in trouble. Here in Vermont, in New Hampshire, in the Adirondacks, and right down the Appalachians to the Smoky Mountains in North Carolina. 
At Oak Ridge National Laboratory, 14,000 tree cores from 31 species, high and low altitude, in 15 eastern states, are now being meticulously studied. The first results assembled by Sandy McLaughlin have been controversial. All 31 species are now growing more slowly than in the past, he says. While some of this is probably natural, he's also looked to see if the growth slowdown is greater in areas of high pollution. Until he reworks the data, he's officially cautious. If we look at the 31 species which we've studied across the region, the growth changes, now remember I'm saying growth changes and not pollution effects, but the growth changes are most pronounced on high elevation species, the ones that occur uh, on the mountaintops where, coincidentally or not, pollution levels are typically highest. But for the five high elevation species, the growth change in the last 10 years compared to this 1930 through 60 reference period is about 40%. So the forest industry could have trouble ahead if the decline is not just on mountain tops and if it's linked to pollution rather than some natural cycle the forest acreage owned by companies will steadily lose its value the great smoky mountains in north carolina perhaps the ideal place to see how difficult it is to answer the questions that hang over our forests Forest scientist Bob Brook is driving up to Mount Mitchell. The summit is in the clouds, like mountains everywhere. It was just about a year and a half ago when I first drove this road in anticipation of seeing or potentially seeing symptoms of decline and dieback. And things have deteriorated quite markedly since, since that particular time. Some of the symptoms that we are beginning to observe, even at this relatively low altitude, are really quite profound. Coming up on our right here, we see a tree that is dying back from the top. In addition, there are numerous dead individuals. Here at the top of Mount Mitchell, six and a half thousand feet up, he discovered a devastated forest. At one time, a drought in the 60s was used to explain forest destruction further north, until Bob Brook found this. Here in the south, there was no drought. But there was something else to add to the confusion, an insect which attacks Fraser fir. It's always caused some damage. Here in the center, you can see its telltale woolly covering. Could it lead to such rapid decline? The rate in which the deterioration of this boreal ecosystem has taken place is really quite astounding. We have photographs taken in the 1970s showing that the Black Mountain Range, which Mount Mitchell is a part of here, was covered with a thick, lush, coniferous ecosystem. There was only minor damage that could principally be attributed to the balsam woolly aphid on Fraser fir populations on this mountain, and here, a mere 10 to 15 years later, we are looking at as much as 90 to 95 percent mortality. Maybe the aphid caused some of this mortality, but spruce trees are dying up here too, and they are immune to aphid attack. There's also obvious yellowing and loss of needles to be seen. A confusing picture, but one that was clarified quite recently by a simple insight. It was provided not by a forest scientist, but by an air pollution expert in St. Louis, Missouri. Rudy Hussar studies trends in oil production, coal production, industrial activity. From all these numbers, he reconstructs how air pollution levels have changed. 1880, seven million. Coal mining figures lead to sulfur emissions, for example. 1881. 20 million. Region by region, he's worked out the impact over the years. Sulfur emission in the northeastern part of the country has not changed substantially since uh, 
the turn of the century. On the other hand, the sulfur emissions for the southeast have been increasing steadily. What is common for both regions is the uh, trend of nitrogen oxide emissions. Automobiles were the reason for this common trend. Since about 1900, gasoline consumption has risen steadily, with the sharpest increase north and south in the 50s and 60s. And the 60s was just the time when trees throughout the east showed the sharp growth decline. If biological effects are observed both north and south, then um, one likely explanation for that would be that it is the nitrogen oxide hydrocarbon mix that is largely responsible for those effects. So nitrogen emissions, not sulfur, went up as the forests declined. Art Johnson thinks it makes sense in the field, and he finds his evidence in the way the spruce needles behave on camel's hump. Brown needles killed by the frost are a common sight here. When we arrive here in the springtime, what we typically find is that a uh, substantial proportion of the needles on these declining trees have turned brown over the winter and these then subsequently fall off sometime during the summer. The needles are abnormally sensitive to frost for a strange reason. Art Johnson believes the nitrogen part of nitric acid could be fertilizing the needles so they keep on growing late into the year. These trees are bathed in uh, cloud moisture for a considerable period of time. The cloud moisture is quite rich in nitrogen and uh, we think there may be substantial uptake of nitrogen into the foliage. The plant continues to grow late into the fall and doesn't harden properly uh, for the winter time, and therefore uh, nitrogen could possibly be a chronic problem uh, that would be occurring over a long term, let's say the length of a growing season. So although the mountain clouds carry sulfuric and nitric acids, in this theory, it's the fertilizing effect of nitrogen that's important. It could be killing the trees with kindness. Germany had the same increase in oil use and emissions as the United States. When nitrogen and hydrocarbons go up, so does the resulting ozone, the pollutant which led to nutrient losses from the needles in Dr. Prince's laboratory. So the nitrogen theory offers consistent explanations. And remarkably, it's an idea which fits with the lakes as well. Normally, in summer, nitric acid is taken up as a fertilizer by the vegetation. Only sulfuric acid reaches the water. But in winter, when plants are dormant, both nitric and sulfuric acids are absorbed and stored up by the snowpack. With spring breakup, a massive pulse of both acids hits the streams, catching the young fish at their most vulnerable, an acid shock from which they may never recover. In this way, nitric acid may contribute to damage here as well. The idea of acid shock has prompted another new theory of forest decline. These young pine trees are experiencing a sudden shock of simulated acid rain. Thin, unhealthy trees are the result, compared to the normal trees on the left. The early results of this experiment show that the roots are different. Normal rain, normal roots. Acid rain, unhealthy roots. This particular tree was removed from lower altitude, about 5,300 feet earlier today. And you may notice that the root system is quite vigorous, it is fibrous, it is light and colored, and the tree appears to be quite normal and healthy. However, this tree just removed from high altitude on Mount Mitchell, which as we could see is in a state of decline, a drop of the needles, appears to be very blackened. Perhaps one of the major differences 
in the reaction of these root systems is their location and the amount of deposition, which correlates nicely back to our laboratory experiments. The theory is that up on the mountains, just as in the laboratory, rain or cloud events lasting hours or days are damaging the root systems. That makes sense, except for one thing. This soil has excellent ability to absorb acids. The roots should be protected even up here at high altitude. Soil scientist Wayne Robarts. One possibility may be that atmospheric deposition is in fact an event process, and that over a very short period of times occurring perhaps in only the upper layers of the soil, where in fact the roots are concentrated, we may have conditions that are detrimental to tree growth. Then, as that time passes, the soil does overcome those short-term effects and returns to normal. It's like the spring shock of sulfuric and nitric acids in the streams. A transient effect, but with lasting damage. In forest ecosystems, we don't really have much information about uh, what happens on an event basis. But it's conceivable that events might be quite important uh, in the forest as well. Uh, events of snow melt and water percolating through the soil, which is extremely acidic or has the uh, contaminants, the other pollutants that are present in uh, melting snow, uh, could be stressful to organisms, uh, but we simply haven't enough information to allow us uh, to say that uh, uh, short-term events are involved in this particular decline disease. We feel encouraged that perhaps we have seen a specific effect of atmospheric deposition on these coniferous roots. However, to say that this is a cause and effect mechanism or relationship to the decline of these trees would really not be proper. Undoubtedly, there are many, many interactions on this mountain that can be taking place. The effect of gases, the effect of certain oxidants, such as ozone, which are present in abundance at the top of this mountain, interacting together holistically in stressing this particular system. And that is the state of acid rain research today. There are many theories of forest decline. Ozone and acid clouds, nitrogen over-fertilization, acid shock to the roots. They are all new. They may all be wrong. They may all be right. But significantly, they all involve nitric acid as well as sulfuric. In the lakes, sulfuric acid, without doubt, causes acidification. But spring acid shocks are a way that nitric acid probably contributes to the damage a typically imperfect science, one familiar to the former administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency, William Ruckelshaus. By the very nature of these environmental public health kind of decisions, uh, we are operating in areas of enormous scientific uncertainty. The public very poorly understands that. They think we've got all the scientific information we need, and then we're hiding it somewhere. We want to give it to them. Why, it'd be very clear what ought to be done. The truth is, there are so many things we don't know uh, in these areas, that it uh, it sometimes is very very unnerving to try to make a decision. But that doesn't mean you don't have to make decisions. Uh, on the basis of the information you do have, uh, often you simply have to make as prudent a judgment as you can, knowing knowing that 50 years from now somebody's going to come back and say, "Boy, there was a dumb one. Look at look at what we now know." And on the basis of that, we never had to do the things he recommended. I'm certain of that. What could be done? One option is to do nothing, because we already control sulfur emissions on new power plants and nitrogen emissions on new cars. Those pollutants will at least level off by the end of the century. It's cheap, but risky. We just don't know how much additional damage we'll do to the forests and lakes. A second option is to control nitrogen not just from cars, but from all burning processes industry, power plants. That's expensive and technically difficult, but likely to help both the lakes and forests. A third option is to cut more sulfur now. That's fairly expensive, will help the lakes to some degree, but probably not the forests. My personal view is that if sulfur and nitrogen compounds and those compounds that produce ozone and hydrogen peroxide are reduced in the air, that it can only help the environment, it will not hurt. 
but to monolithically approach the problem in a hastily way by simply cutting sulfur and then stepping back and assuming that the problem is resolved, this, I believe, is a wrong cause. I would think a prudent man could now decide, we know enough to start bringing these levels down. We know enough to bring them down uh, and get the cheap stuff out first. Uh, we don't know enough to bring them down sharply where the cost just goes straight up. But we can't justify that kind of social expenditure. We can, on the other hand, justify a sort of an insurance policy keeping these levels coming down as we research very hard what's going on and develop the administrative machinery for bringing them down much more sharply if our research dictates that's what ought to be done. Uh, I think that is a prudent approach. I also don't think it's imprudent to say, I need a little more information before I decide to do that. This is a stand on Mount Mitchell. Perhaps the most depressing news about acid rain is that for parts of the environment, it may already be too late whatever we do. One of the most uh, striking things about this particular spot on the mountain is the fact that as we look around, we see very few intermediate sized trees and even fewer small reproduction sized trees on the forest floor. What is to become of the west face of this mountain? The simple fact is, is that we are looking at a forest that is in a state of decline and probably imminent mortality. Uh, if I had to guess, I would say that within 10 years, the majority of the trees in this stand will in fact be dead. When they are dead, obviously they will not be reproducing anymore. And in addition, if there are no intermediate sized trees, if there are no small trees on the forest floor, we may be in for a severe ecological problem. In Sweden, where it all began, Hans Hulteberg and Svante Odin, out on their recently limed and now healthy lake, are also contemplating the future. increased rapidly in uh, needle decline during the last four or five years. Uh, and now we have done a survey by the help of people from Svante's institution, uh, which says that we have about 50% of the trees severely damaged up here, with more than 20% needle loss. And uh, it seems to be severe, getting more and more severe. So in the near future, I guess we'll have a big problem, or I, I think we have the problem here now with the forest decline here in Sweden. We are some five, maybe eight years um, uh, be behind what is in Central Europe. So if you come back here in five years, most of the cover trees here you see here will be dying or being taken away. How much further this kind of destruction will go we don't know. How much further can we allow it to go? We don't know. We know the environment's very resilient. We can perturb it to a large degree and it will still provide us with oxygen and resources to use for our benefit. But that resiliency, the depth of that resiliency is unknown. Another way, another way of saying it is, we don't know how far we can go in damaging ecosystems before they lose their structure and then begin to damage us because of their lack of cohesiveness. I think we must recognize with time that acid rain, ozone episodes, high pollution episodes are a problem of industrialization, not just in the United States, but in all of America, in all of Europe, and pretty soon in all of China and all of Asia, all of Japan. Well, by that time, we are talking about a problem that involves global habitability. It really involves a second look at our spaceship Earth and how we like to see this spaceship Earth develop in the... The material on this video cassette is protected by copyright. It is for private use only, and any other use, including copying, 
reproducing or performance in public, in whole or in part, is prohibited by law.